sometimes when you hear the Buddha's teachings explained. It's almost as if he seems to be playing gotcha. He talks about jhana, the ease, the rapture that can come from concentration. But then you get told that if you try to attain jhana, you're not going to get there. Or once you get there, you have to be very careful not to get attached to it. It's dangerous, so you shouldn't do it too much. Similarly with nirvana. We're told that nirvana is the highest ease, the highest happiness. And yet if you want it, you can't get it. It's like he's dangling it in front of you but says you can't have it. That's not the way he taught at all. The ease and pleasure that come from jhana, he said, are totally blameless. There's that story. As he was struggling to find awakening, he spent six years practicing different austerities. He finally realized that the austerities were a dead end. So the question arose, is there an alternative way? And he thought of a time when he was a child, sitting under a tree while his father was plowing. His mind entered the first jhana. And so he asked himself, why am I afraid of that pleasure? Why am I afraid of that rapture? Is there anything blameless about it? Is there anything harmful about it? And the answer he came up with is no. After all, it's a pleasure that can arise simply by focusing your mind on the breath. You're not harming anyone at all. And in following this pleasure, you're not getting intoxicated with youth or health or life or the other things that intoxicate the mind. So it's a good pleasure to pursue. It was the first factor of the path that the Buddha realized in his quest for awakening. And as with all the other factors of the path, he said it's something to be developed. So when states of ease, pleasure arise in your meditation, try to develop them, try to master them as a skill. The same principle applies to nirvana. The path to nirvana does include desire. Even though nirvana itself is the ending of all desire, you don't get there by ending desire. In other words, that sounds like nirvana is, has to be the path to nirvana. If you can't get to the path, if you can't get to nirvana, you can't get there at all. It puts you in a double bind. But the path actually includes desire. On, on the one hand, there's right resolve. The resolve to overcome attachment to sensuality, the resolve to be harmless, the resolve not to feel ill will. That's a type of desire. And even more explicitly, in the factor of right effort. Right effort starts out where you generate desire for doing away with unskillful qualities to make sure they don't arise again, and you generate desire to give rise to skillful qualities and bring them to the culmination of their development. In other words, the desire here focuses primarily on the path. Nirvana itself is beyond skillful and unskillful, but the elements of the path, like right mindfulness, right concentration, those are skillful qualities that you want to develop, give rise to, and then bring to the culmination their potential. So the Buddha is a very straightforward teacher. He points out that there are good things in the path and it's okay to desire them, simply that your desire should be mature. Immature desire is the kind that wants to get the result without putting in the effort, or focuses so much on the result that you neglect the effort. As the Buddha said, you focus on the causes, and when the causes are ripe, then they yield the result. And through developing the path, you come to realize the cessation of suffering. 
So you focus on the path. And the goal takes care of itself. Sometimes you're, you may hear that the path and the goal are one. And the one way in which that teaching makes sense, if you realize that, okay, in the doing of the path, the goal gets realized. In other words, you're not supposed to sit there just doing the path, passing time, saying, when is the goal going to appear? In other words, doing the path, but with one eye someplace else. You focus your attention totally on the path. On developing the path. And in the developing of the path, the realization of the end of suffering comes. So we focus on bringing the mind to stillness. If the mind hasn't come to stillness yet, ask yourself what's getting in the way. In other words, you use your ingenuity. It's not just desire. You use your desire, you use persistence, you use your intentness, you really focus on what you're doing, and you use your powers of analysis and ingenuity to figure out what's going wrong, what's not working right here, what distractions are getting in the way. You bring all of these what are called bases of success to bear on what you're doing. But they all start with desire. And there are lots of good reasons to want to bring the mind to concentration. Not only for your own sake, it also helps other people as well. Because if your happiness is more inwardly based, then you need less and less from the outside world. As the Buddha said, in order to attain strong states of concentration, the body needs to be nourished. You need a certain level of comfort for the mind to settle down. But it turns out it's not that much. And the more reliable your concentration gets, the easier it is to do with less and less outside. You're placing less of a burden on other people. You're competing with them less. That means you can treat them more fairly. You can go into a situation and you can be you can base your actions and your words and your thoughts totally on goodwill and compassion. Because you realize you don't need anything from those people. It's when you need something from others. That's when your your actions are tilted in terms of bias or prejudice either in terms of things you desire or things that you are irritated by or things you're deluded about or f things that you fear. It's because your happiness is based on something outside, or at least you focus your desire for happiness on something outside. But when your desire for happiness is fo focused inwardly, that places less of a burden on things outside. You need to need less from the outside, which means your compassion for other people can be a lot more clear-headed, balanced, fair. So in this way, the pursuit of happiness through developing strong concentration, through the pursuit of total freedom, is not a selfish thing. as long as your concentration is imbued with the other factors of the path, in other words, right view, right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, it's perfectly safe. They sometimes talk about getting stuck on concentration or becoming a concentration junkie, but those are cases where the concentration lacks the other elements of the path. In other words, your understanding of why there's suffering in the world is skewed, or your understanding of why you're suffering is skewed. 
You will spend all your time just focusing your breath and not wanting to do anything for anyone else anywhere, not wanting to be bothered by the world. Realize it's not the world so much that's bothering you, you're bothering the world by your demands that it be a certain way. It's a weakness in your concentration, and it's a weakness in your discernment. It makes you think that way. If your concentration is really solid, you can stay in all kinds of difficult situations and maintain your balance. Or even if you get knocked off balance in the areas where you're still attached, still, if you've got right view and the other elements of the path, you can get back on into balance. a lot more easily. So the dangers of concentration are largely if it's pursued to the exclusion of the other elements of the path. But right concentration, being focused in this present moment with a full body awareness, a sense of ease, rapture, and then shades into equanimity. That's a valuable thing. It's a valuable skill that, to be able to do that. I mean, there are greater dangers in the path. Dangers of getting teachers who say, well, you can't gain concentration or you shouldn't try. That's pretty dangerous. Or the teachers who tell you that you've attained some level of awakening when you haven't yet. Holding on to that belief is extremely dangerous because it makes you complacent and it really blocks the path. But if you stay in right concentration, which is imbued with mindfulness, imbued with right view, it's in the concentration that you start seeing the stress of clinging to the khandhas. What the Buddha does basically is that he teaches you how to take these aggregates, which we normally cling to in an unskillful way, and teaches you how to cling to them in a more skillful way. pointing out that, yes, it is possible to attain happiness here. But then as you get more and more sensitized to the grosser suffering outside, your hopes for happiness get more and more focused on the concentration. And when they're totally focused here, that's when you can start taking the concentration apart and realizing that even here it's composed of the aggregates, it's still has a potential for being stressful, not self. That spurs you to look for something deeper. But it puts you in the position where you can see that something deeper more clearly as well. In other words, your taste for happiness has been more refined. And repeatedly the Buddha talks about analyzing the concentration in and of itself. Seeing what in the concentration is form, feeling, perception, thought fabrication, consciousness. And realizing that even those aggregates that you were attached to outside, when you would let go of those outside aggregates or the grosser aggregates, there are still these aggregates inside. It's right here that the work can be done. So the Buddha's teachings are very straightforward. Here, he says, is a better, safer, more blameless form of happiness. Go for it. And as you master it, you find there's even deeper levels of happiness ultimately to a level that's totally unconditioned. But it's okay to desire these things. It's okay to make an effort in these directions. It's through the desire and through the effort that you get there. So we learn how to take that desire and focus it in the right place, on the path, on the causes, and the results will come.
It's about as straightforward as you can get.